big, boxy, and packing a whole lot of punch. The B-24 is the bomber that helped make the U.S. a global force. This airplane gave America the ability to strike deeper into enemy territory than ever before. Born into a world on the brink of war. Bulk production of B-24s was essential to this upcoming war. The B-24 became the most mass-produced bomber in history. Every 56 minutes, a completed B-24 rolled out of the end of the line. It, it, it's a miracle. This flying boxcar took on deadly foes. We were trying to get rid of every airplane because we had to break their morale. And earned its name, the Liberator. Our mission was to support the underground in the occupied countries of Europe. This is the story of a bomber that faced tragedy. Aircraft are literally catching fire. It is hell on earth. And risked it all behind enemy lines. There's no choice except to fly straight into the mouth of hell. April 1944. After more than three years of world war, the Allies are on the offensive. But Hitler has a brand new secret weapon, the world's first jet fighter, the ME-262 Swallow. The ME-262 is a single-seat fighter bomber with two turbojet units underslung and four 30-millimeter guns are grouped in the nose of the fuselage. The Swallow flies over 500 miles per hour, faster than any Allied fighter currently in service, making it a deadly addition to Hitler's arsenal. Allied generals vowed to destroy as many of these jets as possible, on the ground and in the air, before the threat gets out of hand. The aircraft to help them do it is America's go-to heavy bomber. Bombs away. The B-24 Liberator. Behind me is the B-24 Liberator, known as the flying boxcar. 67 feet long, nearly 18 feet tall, and over 100 feet wide, the B-24 is a force to behold. The B-24 typically carried 10 crewmen and had some pretty amazing capabilities. It flew faster than 300 miles an hour and could carry 8,000 pounds of bombs. The Liberator has a range of nearly 4,000 miles. And thanks to four Pratt & Whitney turbo supercharged engines, the B-24 can soar to near 30,000 feet. More than 18,000 of these huge airplanes were built during the war. And this airplane gave America the ability to strike deeper into enemy territory than ever before. April 4th, 1945. Bungie Air Base, United Kingdom. Airmen from the 446th Bomb Group prepped their liberators for a daring mission. Fly deep into Germany and take out Wessendorf Airfield, home base to more than two dozen ME-262s. The new Nazi jet, few even know exist. At that time during the war, nobody knew about this fighter plane with the two jet engines, the ME-262. And all of a sudden, the intelligence said, we gotta get rid of these things. We gotta beat them. Flight officer Paul Grassi piloted B-24s with the 8th Air Force during World War II. We were trying to get rid of every airplane we could get rid of that might be on the runway or might be parked. And we needed to wipe them out because we had to break their morale. Grassi's crew know the mission won't be easy. The Germans have hundreds of fighters and anti-aircraft guns stationed near the target. You were a little scared. I mean, these air force that the Germans had, the air bases, they were very, very well armed because the Germans didn't want anything to happen. At 6.30 a.m., Grassy and his Liberator crew take off and begin their three-hour-long journey to Wessendorf. 
we took off, we knew what we had to do, and we knew how to do it. But every time you went up, anything could happen. Once airborne, Grassy's crew gets into formation with more than 1,000 bombers from the 8th Air Force. Monitor crew, check in. Over. If fighters attack, they'll have strength in numbers. We were flying tight formation and staying close because you didn't want them to come through the formation. And also, you had more firepower that way. If we got attacked, we'd be able to hold our own. Navigator to pilot, approaching target. Less than an hour from Wessendorf, Grassy and 24 other Liberators break from the formation and begin their approach. Go time. We were taken away from the big formation to go bomb the airfield. We're on our own. And just before we got there, Bandits bouncing from 9 o'clock high. Bandits bouncing from 9 o'clock high. We heard them yelling bandits in the area over the radio. A swarm of ME-262s is spotted nearby, and they're headed right for the bomb group. It's the very jet the raid planned to bomb on the runway, and the exact situation they all feared. These ME-262s, they could go 500 miles an hour, but we're flying at cruising speed, 165, 170, and there's nothing we can do to go faster. Grassy's formation is unable to outrun the Nazi jets. Their only line of defense are the gunners on board. The primary duty for half of the B-24's crew was to be a gunner. And the job of a gunner was to sight enemy aircraft approaching, call them out, and defend the airplane. Six primary gunners equipped with 50 caliber machine guns are stationed throughout the cabin. There's the nose gunner tasked with defending from head-on attacks. The top turret, covering strikes from above, and the ball turret, positioned beneath the fuselage to counter strikes from below. Towards the back are two waist gunners who protect the Liberator from side assaults, and the tail gunner, responsible for guarding the rear. And the B-24 could cover all angles of attack, so it was important that all gunners kept sharp, kept a lookout, and did their job. And high over Wessendorf, Grassy's gunners must stay on target. These ME-262s were coming in at 11 o'clock. Yeah, they're getting our range. And we were getting ready for the attack. But you can't maneuver like fighters do in a bomber. Well, the navigator. What's the word? Then you hear the gunners yelling. Boom, boom. Grassy's crew unleash a barrage of return fire at the German jets. And all of a sudden, the air's filled with gun cases, 50 caliber machine guns. You've got a keep for you in. I got them. Everybody's yelling. It's a very chaotic experience. And the better you are at flying formation, the better chance you get. Grassy's only option is to stay in tight formation and hope the gunners can keep the German fighters at bay. You're under pressure to not make a mistake. If he gets in trouble or gets hit, boom, he's gone. Amidst the firefight, the bomb group is rattled with gunfire, and three Liberators are shot down. Rear, rear, calling leader. Inboard engine gone. If the gunners can't knock these jets back soon, Grassy and his crew may never make it home. They were really trying to kill you. But we had a job to do. We had to hang in. Come on, Superman. Hey, look, he's high. And they're getting our range. High over East Germany, B-24 pilot Paul Grassy and his bomb group are under attack from a swarm of deadly ME-262 jet fighters. Hey, look, he's flying high. It's a chaotic scene, and to survive, Grassy must stay in tight formation. Mistakes can happen anytime, but the worst place to make a mistake was in a fight like the one we got into. Inboard engine gone. And you just hope that the training you get makes you do the best you can. Hey, look, he's high. With a bit of luck, Grassy's tail gunner finds a Nazi jet in his sights. 
I got him. And miraculously knocks one down. I got him. And it all happens in a matter of seconds. And with all this going on, the biggest thing in your mind is to do your job, which is flying that airplane. Pilot to crew, we're coming up on the bombing run in 10 seconds. Grassy and the remaining B-24s find an opening. Bomb base open. Bombs away. And drop over 180,000 pounds of bombs on Wessendorf. Destroying the airfield. Looks like we gotta leave here. And the dozens of deadly ME-262s parked on the runway. When you got back, you were a little, what happened? Now I know what happened. We almost got killed. Three crews got shot down that day, but we accomplished what we tried to do. It's a major victory for the Liberators, and one step closer to ending the war. But when the war began, the B-24 didn't even exist. February 1939, Hitler's Germany prepares to invade Eastern Europe, and Imperial Japan captures China's Hainan Island. It would have been quite possible to have arranged a peaceful and honorable settlement, but Hitler would not have it. Fear spreads that a second world war is on the horizon. In 1939, the world was a simmering bomb. Germany was rising, Japan was fighting in China, it was clear that the U.S. was going to be pulled into something, but what shape that would take was unknown. Military leaders know they'll need plenty of firepower to fight another world war. And bombers pack the most punch. Fortunately, the U.S. at the time had a fantastic four-engine bomber called the B-17. The Boeing B-17 can fly over 250 miles per hour and carry over 4,000 pounds of bombs. So the U.S. had an effective bomber, but Boeing clearly could not produce them in the kind of numbers that the coming war dictated. So the U.S. government looked to the aviation industry in the U.S. to produce the B-17 under license. Here in this large engineering department is grouped one of the outstanding engineering forces in the manufacture of aircraft today. One such company is Consolidated Aircraft, a small airplane manufacturer based in San Diego, California. But Consolidated doesn't think the B-17 is the right bomber for the war ahead. The B-17 did not provide the performance needed in what was going to be believed in an upcoming war. And in essence, could it fly across the Atlantic Ocean nonstop? No. Could it carry a lot of bombs? No. Could it do that at high speed? And so when Consolidated is given the opportunity to consider building B-17s, they think they can build something better. Consolidated proposes a new bomber design called the Model 32. What Consolidated knew is that they had the bones of a better airplane already in the Model 31 flying boat. Based on their Model 31 flying boat, Consolidated believes the Model 32 will fly faster, farther, and carry more bombs than the B-17. They basically took the wings from this flying boat that they had along with the tail and the government thought it was a good idea and awarded them a contract to create a prototype. March 1939, the U.S. gives Consolidated nine months to build their brand new prototype. But by September, Germany invades Poland and the world erupts in war. Adolf Hitler's all-out attack on Poland makes the long-dreaded European war a certain. The tinderbox that had been smoldering exploded in September 1939 when Germany invaded Poland, which made it even more important that Consolidated get a prototype tested. Consolidated works overtime, and just three months later, the Model 32 takes to the skies for the first time. That initial reaction was enthusiasm, and it was seen as this is going to be a bomber that will be part of a future war. The Model 32 is renamed the B-24 Liberator, and both the U.S. and their allies place massive orders for the new bomber. But by 1941, the war in Europe is dire. Germany occupies France, and the United Kingdom is under siege. President Roosevelt knows U.S. involvement is inevitable. 
and America will need more liberators, and fast. So by 1941, the United States military believed that the mass or bulk production of B-24s was essential to this upcoming war. In June, the United States contracts dozens of companies to build more B-24s, one of which is the Ford Motor Company. So consolidated through no fault of their own, were utterly incapable of producing B-24s in the numbers that the country needed. So in the summer of 1941, the Ford Motor Company very confidently said, we'll just build them like cars. We'll build them on assembly lines. Ford constructs a brand new plant outside Detroit, Michigan to build B-24s, creating a mile long assembly line called Willow Run. It's the first US military aircraft built on an assembly line. And many question whether Willow Run will run at all. Airplanes were essentially hand built at that time. And a lot of people thought that it would be impossible and it would end up being a disaster. But in the end, Every 56 minutes, a completed B-24 rolled out of the end of the line. It, it, it's a miracle. For the next four years, Willow Run continues building liberators in massive numbers, helping make the B-24 the most produced bomber in history. And by the end of 1941, Beyond Europe are the defenses of Axis Asia, Japan, and the country she has conquered. It's clear America will need every bomber they can get. December 1941, Hawaii. The US Army preps its first active B-24 for a top secret reconnaissance mission. As Imperial Japan starts setting its goals on the Pacific, the United States wanted to know what was going on. So that Liberator was there to investigate troop and naval buildups to see what might happen if the Japanese want to expand into the Pacific. But just one day before the mission, Japan attacks Pearl Harbor. A date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by the empire of Japan. Thrusting America into war and destroying the first B-24 before it can get off the ground. I ask that the Congress declare a state of war. If that B-24 could have flown its mission, then the US might have become aware of what the Japanese were going to do in attacking Pearl Harbor. In fact, it, it potentially could have changed history, but we just run out of time. Over the next 12 months, B-24s hammer Japanese forces throughout the Pacific, striking targets as far north as the Aleutian Islands the only Japanese-held territory in North America, and to the southeast, in China and India. And by the end of its first year of service, the B-24 is assigned its longest bombing raid to date. December 21st, 1942, Midway Island. Airmen from the 307th Bomb Group prepare for a daring attack on Japanese forces. The mission, bomb Wake Island, a Japanese fortress just over a thousand miles from Midway. Wake Island wasn't very big, five square miles, but its chief value was in its location. Aircraft based there could protect their new empire from incursions from the east. The Japanese occupation of Wake stands in the way of US operations in the region and is a reminder of what America has already lost. On December 23rd, 1941, the Japanese with a powerful force invaded Wake Island in a fierce half-day battle. They seized it from the American garrison there. The Americans wanted revenge. And with the B-24, they had a bomber that had the range to stage a bombing attack on Wake Island and really damage those Japanese fortifications. But to bomb Wake Island, the Liberators must fly further than they've ever gone before. It's almost seven hours from Midway on to Wake Island. And if they're hit, the return trip is a long way across the ocean with no chance of a rescue. December 22nd, 1942. 
At dusk, 27 B-24s from the 307th Bomb Group take off and begin their seven-hour flight to Wake Island. They have to fly through the dark and attack Wake Island just before dawn. The members of the 307 have no idea what to expect. Get ready on 70 degrees. Not only did they have no idea what to expect, but they had never been in combat before. They had no idea how they would perform. This was a 14-hour mission, seven hours there, seven hours back, in the dark. Any number of things could go wrong. It's the longest mission ever attempted by a bomb group and is a major test of the Liberator's range. The B-24 is built to fly far, really far. The B-24 could fly missions as long as 4,000 miles. And a key feature that gave the B-24 such long range was its long wing, known as the Davis wing. The B-17's wing is 104 feet long. The B-24's shoulder-mounted Davis wing is six feet longer. This long and narrow wing allows for better airflow and greater lift, increasing aerodynamic efficiency and granting the Liberator far greater range. The B-24 had such long range that some crews had missions that lasted as long as 14 or 15 hours. Seven hours from takeoff and under the cover of darkness, the Liberators slip into wake airspace and head to their target. The principal targets for the raid were of the airfield itself, oil and gasoline storage depots, supply dumps, barracks, searchlight positions, as well as anti-aircraft gun sites. The lead two liberators reached their target unopposed and released their bombs. Direct hit. But as the next bombers begin their final approach, trouble. The searchlights came on, and then the big anti-aircraft guns started firing. The sky was pocked with fiery explosions. It was terrifying. The bombers are in the enemy's crosshairs and under heavy fire. The B-24, like any airplane, was vulnerable to anti-aircraft fire it could be knocked down, and there was a near certainty that they would not survive. All the bombers can do is stay the course and hope the wake defenses are unsuccessful. The gunners were especially frustrated. They were too high above the island to have any effect, but they had a good long ride and a good long show. The site's set up. We're ready to bomb. Roger, out. One by one, each B-24 descends to their target and drops their bombs, delivering more than 13,000 pounds of ordnance on the Japanese forces below. And just 40 minutes later, Wake is destroyed, and all 27 Liberators turn back towards Midway unscathed. It was a pretty spectacular feat. Not only did the 307th have excellent effects on the Japanese infrastructure there, but it underscored the value of the B-24 as a long-range bomber. It's the longest U.S. bombing raid to date, and the first of many long-range missions carried out by the 307. The 307s get this nickname, the Long Rangers, and they carry that with them throughout the war as they continue to fly these long missions over water against the Imperial Japanese. The war in the Pacific is heating up, but across the globe, the war in Europe is at a breaking point. August 1943, Allied commanders hope to deal a deadly blow to Hitler's war machine. Their target, Ploesti, Romania, home to one third of the Reich's oil supply. Ploesti was a major source of oil for the Axis. And it was a series of wells and refineries around Ploesti, Romania. So a decisive strike that knocked those oil fields out could potentially cripple the German military. But attacking Ploesti won't be easy. The Germans and the Romanians understood the value of Ploesti, and they spared no expense in making sure it was well defended. They had everything from their top-of-the-line radars 
down to smoke pits and decoys, ready to defend Ploesti in case of an American air attack. To take out Ploesti, Allied generals hope to make a surprise attack and overwhelm the Reich with sheer force. So the plan is to maintain the element of surprise as long as possible so that the Germans can't mount an effective defense and hopefully knock out the refineries for good. To destroy Ploesti with one major blow, the U.S. Army Air Force calls on the B-24. The B-24 was chosen for this mission because, number one, it was readily available, but most importantly, it was the only American heavy bomber that could reach Ploesti with a reasonable payload. The B-24's two central bomb bays can carry up to 8,000 pounds of ordnance, twice the payload capacity of the B-17. Depending on the mission, a typical load for a B-24 would be 16 500-pound high-explosive bombs or eight 1,000-pound high-explosive bombs. When loading the Liberator, the crew retracts a unique set of bomb bay doors. The B-24 sat very low to the ground, so they came up with a way by using the same feature as a roll-top desk, and the doors simply rolled up on tracks and then slid back down. Pound for pound, the B-24 is a force to behold. The fact that the B-24 could carry 8,000 pounds of bombs meant that fewer airplanes could deliver a bigger punch. And to take out Ploesti, generals will need all they can carry. August 1st, 1943, Benghazi, Libya. Nearly 180 B-24s take off toward Ploesti. When these big four-engine American B-24s take off, they spun dust into the sky and created a virtual dust storm. It was apparent right then that something big was afoot. As the dust settles, the bombers get into formation and begin their journey across the Mediterranean. But not long after takeoff, the problems begin. One B-24 carrying a lead navigator crashes into the Mediterranean, and it causes part of the formation to go off course. Bit by bit, the careful timing sequence starts to come apart. 20 minutes later, the bomb group course corrects and begins their low-level approach on Velesti. The decision was made to fly very, very low because that ensured good accuracy. However, these B-24s were within the range of every sort of anti-aircraft gun the Germans and the Romanians possessed. In a flash, a barrage of artillery fire fills the sky. What the B-24s encounter is a defense like they've never seen before. The Germans have hundreds of anti-aircraft guns. It's a wall of flak and fire and the B-24s are attempting to attack from just a few hundred feet. As the B-24s begin bombing their targets, Ploesti defenses intensify, and raging fires consume the oil refineries below. The refineries are burning so hot that in some instances, aircraft are flying over them and literally catching fire. It is hell on earth. It's a terrifying sight, but the bombers have come too far to turn back. If they deviate from their course, they can't hit the target. There's no choice for these B-24s except to fly straight into the mouth of hell. August 1st, 1943. Floesti, Romania. Nearly 200 B-24 bombers are in the fight of their lives. Ploesti is a seething mass of anti-aircraft guns, smoke pots, and B-24s coming in from 50 to 500 feet. This is a scene that no one has ever seen before. But the B-24s were not helpless. Those gunners traded fire with the anti-aircraft gunners. 
and essentially what you had was an incredible air to ground duel. Amidst the chaos, the Raiders refused to give up, bombing as many targets as possible. There were instances where aircraft were afire, and yet they continued to the target, dropped their bombs, and essentially sacrificed themselves for the mission. After nearly 30 minutes of the onslaught, the remaining B-24s dropped the last of their bombs and limped back to base. As badly as the mission had come apart, the bravery of the men was such that a significant percentage of the refining capacity at Ploesti was taken out of service. It was a tremendous act of bravery and dedication to duty. In recognition of their bravery, 56 airmen are awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross, and three receive the Medal of Honor posthumously. No less than five men were awarded the Medal of Honor. Of these, only Colonel John Keane and Colonel Leon Johnson lived to receive their nation's highest tribute. But the awards are little comfort. Over 50 B-24s are lost during the raid and more than 300 airmen never return, marking the largest loss of B-24s of the war. The raid to Ploesti made a point to Allied leadership that they were going to pay a high price to hit targets that were critical to winning the war effort. Since the start of the war, more than 2,000 liberators are lost over Europe. Many pilots claim the B-24 is too difficult to fly and susceptible to flak, earning it the nickname, the Flying Coffin. The survivability of the B-24 is seen as a disadvantage, and so the preference was the B-17. It was easier to fly, it was more rugged, it survived more damage. But Liberators are available in massive numbers, and thanks to its payload and range, the Allies make use of the B-24 for a variety of missions. There are all these other roles that the B-24 fulfilled, transport, reconnaissance, carrying fuel, special operations, all these things, and not only for the U.S., but for the Allies, and in particular, for Commonwealth forces. As the war rages on, the B-24 excels as a multi-purpose airframe, and one of its most important missions is a covert one. August 1944, just two months since the D-Day invasion. Northern France is nearly liberated, and the Allies plan to take a critical target, Antwerp Harbor. We needed a port desperately. Antwerp, Germany's key to the invasion of England, could unlock the door to Germany. Located on the Scheldt River, Antwerp is Europe's second largest port and the perfect launching point to invade Germany. But taking Antwerp won't be easy. The Germans have lined the port with ships rigged with explosives and plan to detonate them should the Allies attack. The Germans had their explosives in place ready to demolish the harbor. But General Wild Bill Donovan, director of America's Office of Strategic Services, or the OSS, has a solution. Run a covert operation into Antwerp using the OSS top secret unit of airmen known as the Carpetbackers. The OSS was the intelligence service during World War II. Lieutenant Eugene Polinsky served as a B-24 navigator for the OSS Carpetbackers. We were a secret outfit, and our primary mission was to support the underground in the occupied countries of Europe. Active since 1943, the Carpetbaggers are America's special operations airmen, responsible for flying secret agents, weapons, and critical supplies behind enemy lines. The perfect unit to help take back Antwerp from the inside. General Donovan said, you get my Carpetbaggers to fly magnetic mines into Belgium to the underground Put these mines under all of these ships and you will sink them harborside 
then we can force an attack and we will save Antwerp. It's a daring mission, and some generals fear it's too risky. And they said, you can't do this because your OSS carpetbaggers never had to do something like this as a large mission. And Donovan, uh, in effect, said, you got a better idea? August 7th, 1944, United Kingdom. Polinsky and his fellow carpetbaggers load up a modified Liberator for their top secret mission, to arm the Belgian underground. The OSS used B-24s because they were very reliable, they had a greater capacity than most of the other bombing planes of that time. And a B-24 could go the depth of Europe and return with no problem. It will be the OSS's fourth attempt to supply the Belgian resistance and Polinsky's final mission as a carpetbagger. Because it was my last mission, I felt that I had to be particularly careful and I wanted desperately for this mission to succeed. At dusk, Polinsky and his crew take off. It's just over a two-hour flight to the drop zone. If we didn't make a successful rendezvous, it was almost solely because there were Germans in the area and the underground was simply not there. As the navigator, it's up to Polinsky to get them there safely and undetected. The biggest risks were being discovered, were being captured, because we were considered spies by the Germans. We were shot down and we survived that. They would shoot us because we were spies. Two hours later, Polinsky and his crew reach the Belgian border. If they're discovered, they likely won't survive. This was after three other attempts to do the same mission were shot down. But at the time, I did not know about that. It was just another mission to me. So I didn't know how bad our situation was. High over occupied Belgium, OSS B-24 navigator Eugene Polinsky and his fellow carpetbaggers are attempting to deliver vital weapons to the Belgian underground. If they're detected, the resistance may lose their only chance to liberate Antwerp Harbor. At worse, the crew likely won't survive. We could have been shot down at any time. We could have gone to the wrong place. Yeah, I was cautious. I took a deep breath more than once. 30 minutes from the Belgian border, Polinsky and his crew reach the drop zone undetected and breathe a sigh of relief. We got to our rendezvous and my pilot said, this is it, fellas, after this, we're home. One by one, the supplies are launched from the bomb bay and safely parachute to the resistance fighters waiting below. The containers went out on trip shoots, and my pilot made her a loop around to make sure the underground had gotten the OSS delivery perfectly, and he was perfectly right. With supplies in hand, the Belgian underground destroys the Nazi doomsday ships and seizes part of the port, dealing a sudden and decisive blow to the German occupation. In one day, life in the city changed entirely. The Belgian underground seized the locks and over 600 cranes. And less than two weeks later, Allied forces capture the harbor unopposed, finally liberating the people of Antwerp. For four years, the people of Antwerp had known only oppression. Now the suddenness of liberation was overwhelming. It's a major success for the OSS carpetbaggers, but Polinsky must keep it secret. My CO of our squadron said, this whole OSS operation is secret. You are not allowed to speak anything about this. I did nothing for 50 years, and it's taken a long time, but it's generally being recognized as a turning point for the success of the war. With control of Antwerp, the Allies receive a steady supply of tanks, munitions, and equipment as they continue their aggressive push into Nazi Germany. And by May 1945, 
Germany surrenders. And the war in Europe ends. Victory in Europe brought wild rejoicing throughout the Allied world as the Big Three announced the downfall of Nazi Germany. But the war in the Pacific is far from over. With the war over in Europe, the Army Air Forces was shifting its combat units to the Pacific in anticipation of a long, prolonged war against the Japanese. Battle-tested liberators conduct round-the-clock raids against Japanese forces in the South Pacific, bombing targets in the Philippines, Rabul, and China, all while inching closer and closer to Japan's home islands. As the Allies slowly creep up through the Pacific, the B-24s are operating from these island bases, and as they get all that way north, towards Japan, the B-24s are neutralizing targets as part of this grand strategy of island hopping, which was gonna to lead to an invasion of the Japanese home islands. But before Japan's home islands are within the B-24's range, a new bomber joins the fight, the B-29 Super Fortress. The B-29 had double the power of a B-24. It could fly faster, it could fly higher, and it could fly almost double the range. And so in terms of the performance of this airplane, it just went far beyond what a B-24 could do. The B-29's greater payload and superior range is enough to put the B-24 out of business. And by August, the B-29 proves its worth and drops the bombs. At Hiroshima came the world-shaking explosions of the atomic bomb. The plans for the invasion of Japan included strategic bombers like the B-24. And with the dropping of the atomic bombs, they were no longer needed. The B-29's atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki shocked the world. And just six days later, Japan surrenders. A message from the Japanese government, I deem this reply the unconditional surrender of Japan. So the end of the war really brought the end of the B-24. And it's really quite remarkable how quickly it happened. In some cases, there were B-24s that were flown right from the factory, right to boneyards to be melted down. But not all B-24s are scrapped. Some are used for target practice. Others are repurposed for commercial transport. And a few join smaller air forces, such as the Indian Air Force. But by the 1960s, the jet age has become the standard and the world's remaining liberators are retired from military service. Some make it into museums, some uh, become warbirds, but only a handful uh, remain today. But the B-24, maybe more than any other aircraft, shows the value of air power in every part of World War II. Over 18,000 B-24s rolled off the assembly line. It's the most produced American military airplane in history. And each one proved range matters. The B-24 helped the Army Air Forces be a global force because the B-24 was employed all across the globe. Often overlooked, but never underutilized. From a get it done perspective, it was magnificent. The B-24 took on tough fights. I thought it was the greatest airplane ever and earned its name, the Liberator. We were liberating people, and I think we did a hell of a job. From Germany to Japan and everywhere in between, the B-24 gave the Allies strength in numbers, and no matter the mission, answered the call.